All right, good morning. We're glad you're here. And I was gone last week. And was it Clint or Jim that spoke? I get them, I get them so confused. Okay. Um, so, uh, one of them did a great job last week. Oh. And uh, now we're going to return to the series we started just before I left called On Your Mark. And uh, last week, uh, I took some time off with Peggy and our kids and their spouses. We got one of those hotel rooms where there's the kitchen, living room, dining room, and then all the bedrooms are around the outside. And um, we just, we had a great time. We did some hiking, some kayaking. We were uh, in two harbors, which is just up the lake shore, Superior Lake Shore in Minnesota. Um, so that was fun. And the, the series called On Your Mark, the, the one that we're in, is, is a series where we're getting kind of ready for the fall and we're getting ready to, to be aggressive in our outreach. So we started with that first Sunday, um, a, a message where Jesus compared a shepherd who is looking for a sheep to himself and looking for people who, who don't yet know him and don't have a relationship with him. And in that story, we, we get an idea of his passion and his desire to see every single person know him and be in love with him and have a relationship with him. And we're going to build on that theme today. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to start at verse 19. I'd love it if you get out your Bible and find those verses. And while you do, um, let me just give you a series of beliefs that I have. First of all, I believe that Jesus desperately loves every single person. And he wants a relationship with them. And I believe that every person has the right to not only hear about the love of Jesus, but to experience that love of Jesus. I also believe that Jesus commissioned us to be the hands and feet that do that and show that love. And I believe that there are special blessings that come to us when we fulfill that mission that he's given us. And those are the beliefs that are underpinning this whole series. And it's those beliefs that bring me to where I want you to join me in this desire to reach people who don't yet know Jesus. Because I believe there are special blessings for us when we, when we share Jesus with others, I, I want you to share in those blessings. I want you to be a part of that. And for people, a lot of times they're like, oh, but that's so scary. No, no, it's not. I'm, I'm not asking you to stand on the street corner and yell at people that they're going to hell. I'm not, none of that. Just show the love of Jesus. When people go like, why do you do that? You just go like, well, um, Jesus has shown his love for me and I just, I can't help but share it with you. There you go. It's that hard. And it's, it's just so easy. And what, what I... The, part of the reason I want to share this is because the, the Bible tells us that there's these blessings for us. And, and number two, I, I've experienced those blessings for myself. And I want you to have those blessings. And the Apostle Paul is talking about these kinds of things in 1 Corinthians 9. So let's, let's pick it up, let's read what he has to say, and let's, let's talk about it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 19. Paul says, Though I am free, and I belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, uh, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, although I'm not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, and so as to win those not having the law. But to the weak, I became weak to win the weak, and I become all things to all people, so that by all means possible, 
I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. All right, so when we read an epistle, which, which an epistle is a fancy name for a letter written by an apostle to people, um, we, when we read these letters, we have to kind of keep in mind that there's a very specific context going on. And usually, the person writing the letter and the person receiving the letter has like a history. They, they've had discussions or interactions in the past, and we didn't get in on that. So sometimes we have to kind of piece things together, kind of read between the lines in order to understand everything that's going on. And so as we look at this, one of the things that we notice is that... Um, the Apostle Paul is talking about being free. And, and he's, he seems to be having, like, I would say, almost an argument with the Corinthians. And, and here's, here's what the, some of the Corinthians are saying. They're saying, well, the Apostle Paul is not really an apostle. And the Apostle Paul is not really even a good missionary. And... And the Apostle Paul is in the middle of a long argument saying, I am an apostle, and I am a missionary, and, and I should be seen as one. So that's, that's what his argument is. But in the middle of that argument, he makes a statement. And he says, though I am free, I belong to no one. He's like, wait, um, what's this free thing? Well, he's saying, I'm not a slave. It's not like I've been bought, and I'm... I'm in a slave position. I'm a free man. And you might be asking yourself, like, okay, I, I, I can understand that. But there's a deeper context going on. See, part of the argument here is that the Corinthians, these guys were filthy rich. Okay? They had lots of money. And that means that you, you don't go and mow your own lawn. You hire someone to do that. You, you hire a second-class person, a slave. You, you have these people who have to do everything that you want. They, they cook your meals, they wash your dishes, they mow your lawn, they, they do all that stuff for you. And the problem that the Apostle Paul is having is that he doesn't have any servants. In fact, he's made himself a slave. And so these people are disregarding him, at least some of the people in the Corinthian church, are looking down on him and going like, no, oh, he's a nobody. And the Apostle Paul says, no, it's not like I am a slave. It's not like I, I'm not educated. It's not like I'm not um, smart. It's that I made myself into a slave for the gospel of Jesus. I've decided to put myself in that position on purpose. And so the Corinthian church are looking down at him because they see manual labor as demeaning. It's, it's just this lower class thing. And the Apostle Paul goes into great detail about his, his position of slavery, despite the fact he's not a slave. He says, you know, for the Jews, um, I became like a Jew. I follow all 613 laws. Uh, I, I eat kosher. I'm in a synagogue every Saturday. I do, I do all those things. And why do I do it? Because I'm, I'm fitting in with them. I'm, I'm aligning my life with them so that I can tell them about Jesus, about the Messiah Jesus. And then there's the Gentiles, the, the people who, who aren't Jewish, and, and they don't have the 613 laws, and, and they don't eat kosher. And so I, I have bacon and pork chops. You know, I, I join in with them. Um, now, I, I keep my moral standards, but but I don't follow the, all the Old Testament laws. And, and then he says, you know, even for those who have like moral weaknesses or maybe addictions, where they're really struggling with temptation, I, I make a, myself a slave to them by setting it up so that I don't tempt them. I don't put myself in a situation where, where I would lead them down the wrong road and, and, and put them in a place of temptation. I do all of this, he says, because of the blessings of the gospel. He's, he's talking about these blessings, these, this sense of joy and peace that comes with telling people about who Jesus is. And he loves doing this. And I thought to myself, what, what if we could get like a, a time machine and transport the Apostle Paul here? 
Like, what, what would he do? How would he do this? What, what car would he drive? What house would he live in? What Iowa team would he, would he root for? You know, uh, because basically his attitude is, I, you know, if I'm in Jessup, I, I become like a Jayhawk to, to win the Jayhawks to Jesus. He does this sense of adaptation. And, and I thought to myself, like, where would the Apostle Paul spend his time? Would he spend all this time here at the church? Would he just hang out here? I, I wonder if he wouldn't spend the majority of his time down at the legacy. Why? Because people who don't know Jesus don't hang out at church. He, he, would, he would put himself in situations on purpose to be with people who don't know Jesus. And I just, I think to myself, are we going to have that missionary mentality? Because what missionaries do is they, they go to a different country, they, they learn the language, they change how they dress, they eat the food that's local, and they, they become like the people that they're with. Why? Because as they align their lives, and as they get close to these people, it gives them this opportunity to, to describe Jesus in ways that these people can understand and to show them love in, in very real ways. And so it's, it's the missional mentality. Have you, have you heard the word missional? Like this, this word is really popular among the, the new churches. The new churches talk about the missional mentality. And the missional mentality is that I'm a missionary wherever I go. That's the missional mentality. That I wear Jesus' name all the time. Wherever I go, whatever I'm doing, every moment is a possibility of showing the love and grace of Jesus. And the question is, are, are we going to take on this missional mentality? Are we going to to show God in a very real way. And last week, Jim talked about wearing God's name. Do we wear it in vain? Do we, do we make God, do we make Jesus look bad by how we live? Or do we bring him glory? It, a, a missional mentality starts with this thing where I come second and other people come first. And what if we not only did that wherever we go, like as we're out and about with people, but what if we did that as a church? What would it look like to have a missional mentality as a church? See, like right now, what we do is we say, you know what, I want the church service at this time because it's convenient for me. I want this kind of music because it's, it's the music I prefer. Uh, I, I want to hang out with my friends at church. And, you know, we just, what we like to do is just cluster up and, and kind of almost like a fortress mentality. We, we hide in our churches away from people. What if we were to open up the doors and we were to say, come on in. And we were to create this environment where people felt welcome and connected and instead of clicking up with our friends, we, when people walk in the door, we, we had this like, we're glad you're here. And, and we took time to just be with them and connect with them and encourage them. So what, what does it look like to design a church that isn't for us, but for people who don't know Jesus? What if, what if we took on this mentality of, I'm, I'm not here as a customer of the church. I'm here as an employee of the church. Wow, can you imagine the ministry we could do if every single one of us had a missional mentality in the church? Wouldn't that be amazing? 
Because then there would be this attitude of, you know, I'm saved. I, I know Jesus. I, I know where I'm going. But there's, there's a neighbor, a friend, a coworker. There's people who don't. And do I care? Does that matter to me? I, I was thinking, uh, we, in, in our work, we do have a, a mentality that says, okay, so there's this customer out there that we have to take care of. John Deere. Let's just say John Deere takes on a mentality that says, you know, we build tractors for a long time. Um, and we like the tractors that we have. We're going to quit changing how we do tractors. We are going to make the same tractors we have always made, and we're going to keep them in the same. Because when, when we change things around, that means we have to redo the, the line. We have to retrain our employees. Um, we have to find different parts. Uh, let's, just, let's just quit changing our tractors, and let's just stay the same the way we've always done it. Can you imagine in 10, 20, 30 years, what would happen if they took on that mentality? And yet, the church has a tendency to do that very thing of, ooh, you know, we like, how, we've done church for a long time. We don't want to change. And it doesn't matter to us that other people, the people out there don't like it. This is for us. We're the customers. Can you imagine John Deere if all the employees were like, hey, we're the customers of John Deere. I mean, this is about us. Well, how, how long does a business survive with that kind of mentality? So, what, who is the customer of the church? And if we take on a mentality that there are people out there who, who need the love of Jesus, who need ministry, who need to be uplifted, wow, we could do so many wonderful things. And the blessings that come with that, I, the, the thing that I love to do out of everything, the most fun is when someone is struggling to figure out Jesus and I get to sit down and just have a cup of coffee and let them talk. I love that. There is nothing more fun than to have someone asking all the tough questions about Jesus and about Christianity. So I'm calling this series On Your Mark because I want us to get to our mark of being ready. And I'm calling this particular message Get Set because what happens is when runners are going to run, the the starting line umpire, or whatever they're called, says, okay, runners on your mark. And they move in position to the right lane. And then he says, get set. And that's when they get down into the blocks, right? And they take a position that means we are ready to jump out of the blocks and really go. And I want us to get set to be thinking about how is it that we can have a missional mindset each individually and all of us as a church to love people like Jesus loves people. To serve people like the Apostle Paul served people. So how, how can we set it up so people feel the love of Jesus? How can we be slaves of Jesus ready to serve them and how can we help people who walk through the door feel welcomed and encouraged to study for themselves and figure out, is this something I want to do? Is, do I want to have a relationship with Jesus? And to make it okay for them to struggle and, and uh, dive in and understand this. And I think an early step on that would be the, the P3 cards that we had sitting out just as you walked in. If you didn't get one, pick one up on the way out. And here's what I want you to seriously consider. The P3 card is actually two cards in one. They're, they're perforated so that you can tear them. The one portion tears off, and I'd like you to put that in the donation station and to sign it if this is a commitment you want to make. What's the commitment? The commitment is to pray for three people, for three minutes a day, for three months. 
So tape this up to your bathroom mirror, tape this up to the refrigerator, to the car dashboard, to wherever it is that you have some time to think and pray. And, and write in some names. Who is it that God is putting on your heart to be praying for? And here's what I found. When I start praying that God gives me opportunities to share Him, watch out. <laughs> Because he drops people right in your lap. This is, this is a prayer that he loves. And, and again, don't, don't make it a high pressure thing. Just engage people. Ask them what they believe. Let them talk. Let them wrestle. You don't have to have all the answers. Just let them know that you, you found this sense of joy and peace in who Jesus is and encourage them to search it out for themselves. If you're willing to make this commitment, I would love it if you would let, let me know. Drop this card in. Take this home. Think through who God wants you to put on the list and to begin to pray. And in fact, I'm going to give you a moment now to just set this in front of God and talk to Him. Ask him how you can take a missional mindset and how you can begin to pray for people. And so I'll get to give you a minute just to do that now, and then we'll close our service with prayer.